I'm a bad guy. I don't read time in Newsweek. Oh, well, I'm going to have to do something about that. Send me a subscription and I'll start reading it. Well, I can't afford it. Rich and famous, Bob. Oh, okay. No, but really they were saying that uh, as a woman reaches 35 and 40, her chances of marriage dwindle. In fact, she's more likely to be killed in a terrorist attack than to get married. <laughs> that oh, that's terrible. <laughs> I thought that was I thought that was excellent. I my reaction was the same. It was supposed to be oh my god, you know. But I thought that was outrageous. Um, I'm familiar with similar studies, even though I didn't see that piece. Oh yes, and then you know what that does? That burns on a whole lot of calls about oh I can't meet anyone at the bars that I'm going to, and uh, everyone is not my type. Meeting people at bars is a rough way to go. Don't you agree? I have no sympathy for people who complain about that. And have you looked around? They all look the same. They all look like they've just come from a funeral or something. Yeah. How would you ever... But nonetheless, it's, it's almost impossible, especially when you re reach a certain age, to meet people. And, you know, where else can you go and have a shot at maybe 30, 40, or 50 people in one evening? than a bar. You know, it's awfully tempting. We all know that it's a, a rough way to go and a bad way to go and that your odds of any kind of success, and I'm not talking about one night stand success, but success in a relationship are virtually minuscule. But, you know, what else are you supposed to do? It's tough. Well, I think it's all the attitude, too. I mean, if they're, if they're acting as if they're looking for the first male that's eligible that they're going to marry, guys are going to run for the hill. They would be stupid to do otherwise, I would assume. Oh, I don't know about that. Oh, really? Really, I think that probably most men in their 30s, 40s, and 50s who are making the bar scene are genuinely looking for a relationship. Yes, but maybe... You know, pleased to settle for a one-night stand, thank you, but I believe deeply in my heart they're looking for a wife. No. Or a live-in, long-term uh, lover. You really think? So? Yes, I do. Huh, that's interesting. Well, you should know better. Uh, studies have shown dramatically time and time and time again that men, the older they get, the more they crave marriage. It's the women, the older they get, that uh, the more independent they come, but men become more dependent. See, yeah, I don't know. Especially if they've been married before. No, but what they were saying in this article, they were saying that most of the uh, women who have chosen careers, uh, particularly the baby boomers, Mm -hmm. that now that they have their careers, they want to have a family and a husband and settle down, and it's not that easy anymore because the numbers are against them. Mm -hmm. Population-wise, there's uh, more women than there are men, and uh, that, that's against them. So they're, they're showing the alternatives that they'll settle for having Single, uh, well, we had this conversation privately before, and I expressed this view then, and I'll express it now. Yeah, sure, the numbers are against them, but I think there's something else that's against them, too. And that is that I believe, you know, and I can really only go from myself, from my own perspective, and from a handful of other people that I know in similar situations, but I believe that the older a man gets, the less likely he is to want this independent, uh, linen, woman's lid type of female. He wants a more traditional... And again, especially if he's been married, and especially if he's been married to an independent woman. He wants a more traditional female. Yes, but... Which is going to keep you away from those lawyers and CPAs. Pardon me? Which is going to keep you away, drive you away. You know, hi there, sweetheart, what do you do? I'm a CPA. Thanks, see you some other time. Hi there, sweetheart, what do you do? I'm a secretary. All right, so not ready to drink. <laughs> well, that's a rather bizarre attitude, but I think that with... What the point of this was that a lot of these women are now looking for that kind of life. Maybe they are more willing to go into this subservient role. And they also pointed out what mother always told you, you know, to settle down and have a family. And now they're seeing that, oh my, I should have done that as their biological clock is ticking away, they say. Well, I, I, I've told you quite candidly, again in private conversations, that I was married to a a very independent, a very liberated type woman. I made her independent and liberated. She was not that when I married her. 
And I, I am confident that uh, the second time around, no way, Jose. <laughs> don't need it again. And, you know, coming from Lasseter, that's a very heavy statement. Oh, my. Well, it is, because I like people who have, well, at least what I consider to be, others may not, but I like people to have what I consider to be a brain on their head. And it's a, it must be hell to have a brain inside your head and still have to play this, this silly man, male, female, man, woman game. Well, I don't know. You know, because I believe in my heart that men and women are equal, and yet I don't want an equal relationship anymore. What do, what do you want? I, I just told you, the, the more traditional. Oh, you do? Yes. So the women of Tampa better watch out. None of the women of Tampa have anything to worry about at all. <laughs> okay. Be good. Thank you, Bob. Take care. Bye. Braden, and hi, you're on the air to Yeah, hi. A little earlier you were talking about her. Uh-huh. Anyway, um, how do you feel about Norman Rockwell? I enjoy looking at Rockwell's work from time to time. I wouldn't want it hanging in my house, but it gives me a great warm feeling when I do stumble upon it. But I wouldn't want to look at it every day. Oh, because um, I'm in ninth grade, and in school we're um, talking about Art now, and that's about the first artist I ever really liked. Oh, his, his work is very sentimental, and it brings back you know, great warm feelings, and of course, uh, basically, uh, even the period that Rockwell was painting and what he was painting wasn't real. It, it was a, a contrivance. But it's what we would like to think life is about. It's what we would like to think the country is about and what the good old days were about. And it makes me feel good, but I wouldn't want to look at it on my wall anymore. Oh, well, I've got one thing in my room. I just think it's wonderful. Oh, that's cool. Well, but that's what art's all about. Yeah. You know, it, it's not supposed to turn everybody on. Uh, Art wouldn't be fun to look at if there weren't a zillion different styles and a zillion different topics. Uh, on my walls, I prefer abstract. I prefer color and form. Uh, I'm not into pictures on my wall. Oh, okay. But I like to look at them. Okay, I have one more question. Sure. Do you enjoy what you do? Yes, I do. You do? Mm hmm If you had, if you could start all over, would you do the same thing? Yeah, hopefully a little bit earlier, because I didn't get into talk radio until I was 39. Uh, how old are you now? 40. Oh, okay. So I've been doing it about a year and a half. Oh, what were you doing before then? Music radio, I was a disc jockey. Oh, okay. Well, it was nice talking to you. Good talking to you. Okay, bye. Take care. Tampa, 224-0057. Pinellas, 393-0057. Sarasota, Bradenton, 746-0057. Need I tell you it's an open program? I have no idea if you guys are enjoying this or not, but I'm just in a really strange philosophical and uh, mellow mood this evening. What can I tell you? Bradenton, you're on the air, WPLP. Mr. Lafferty? Yes, sir. Uh, because of a program you had on one of, either the first or the second Saturday night, I thought it was one of the absolutely the best talk show program I ever heard. That was when you asked people about religion. Hmm, my favorite topic. Yeah, and as a result, because of some doubts I've had before that, particularly the TV evangelism and my distaste and everything with reference to born again fundamentalists, etc. I started going to a oh, bookstore over in St. Petersburg. You've probably heard of it. I won't give the name because I understand you don't like that sort of stuff. But anyway. Well, you can give the name. doesn't bother me. Hard one. Okay. Fine. And I got it's in there, and it's like a new world, you know. It reminded me of my college days and all that stuff. And I went in, and I got uh, oh, Gibbon, and I got H.D. Uh, Wells' Outline of History. Picked mm -hmm. up uh, Durant's uh, Caesar in Christ. As a result, I've got a question I'd like to ask you, particularly want to ask you because of your background, okay? Sure. But before I do, I'd like your permission to make a comment about a caller of yours about four or five calls ago, okay? Go for it. And the comment is this. She found it to me like an elderly lady inquiring as to whether or not you've had your hands clapped by management, and that's why you're in mm -hmm. such a better mood today and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And she said she was so glad you not to hear that profanity, and I'd like her to know, and I hope she's listening. You have never used a profane word on your program at any time, at least to the time I've been listening. I haven't used any word that Tim Coles doesn't use. Pardon? I haven't used any word that Tim Coles doesn't use. <laughs> well, there's another station. <laughs> I won't mention the name of the man, but my God, he might just well go out with the rest of the words and be done with it. But the lady irked me because she's typical of elderly people. 
you can you can surmise her background real quick, or at least I think you can. But when she says profanity, she was so relieved not to hear profanity. Lady, if you're listening, uh, hell and damn, they are not profane words. Profane or profanity refers to, uh, you know, like uh, GD, the... the right, basically taking... The entry, in other right, words. right, basically taking God's name. Right, yeah, something along our Ten Commandments. But here's my question, because... I'm getting very, very frustrated trying to figure out the answer to the following question. Because just once, if I ever get on one of those <laughs> programs, I'm going to have somebody born again to You know, you keep waving this Bible in the nose, like a swagger, and they say, oh, I'd like to say, what is your understanding of when what you call this Bible, where everything in the, the answer is all in there, when was the New Testament put together? Now, real quickly, I listened to a Catholic TV program, just for a change, and I was dumbfounded because the priest said, quote, the, that uh, he was commenting about the Bible and the Catholic approach to that stuff, and he said that the New Testament actually was formed by, he said specifically, the Vatican II Council, which is in about the 4th century, he said, and that that's when the, what then thereafter became known as the Catholic Church, at that time, in that, that period of time, they brought in all the the priests, etc., from, from the far-reaching outlines and all that, and they, they said this is going to be what later became known as the New Testament. Is that your understanding from your uh, youth as a Catholic in school? Basically, yes. The New Testament uh, was uh, between 60 to 400 years after the fact, depending upon which, which portion, which books you're talking about. Okay. Well, I'm talking about the New Testament yeah. as... Uh, well, the, the books of the New Testament were between 60 to 400 years after the fact. Okay, that's a fair statement the way you put that. Now, my question is, that is, is it your understanding also that it was what, I guess, we could say the predecessor to our present-day Catholic Church, or Catholicism, they're the ones that selected the New Testament, weren't they? Uh, I guess so, uh, because there really wasn't any other major Christian religion until, what, uh... 1500? Yeah, Martin Luther. Uh, Martin Luther. Yeah. So then, <laughs> when all these Protestants... Uh, well, enough said, that's some comment I can reserve for myself later to enjoy. That's your you. understanding, too, right? Basically, yes. Uh, that's just terrific. Well, then, just let me give you one parenthetical thought, and I'll hang up, because I know there are a lot of people listening to you tonight wanting to talk to you, but... In that store, I got a book called The Lost Scriptures, you know? Mm -hmm. And you talk about some of the thoughts you've expressed on the air, and particularly that one Saturday night. I was just in heaven. I wanted to talk to you so bad, but those lines were swamped. Because when you talked about your inquiries about, well, will you believe everything in this, uh, you know, Mark and Matthew and the Acts and Revelations, I think it's just, you know, perfectly my, my opinion is that Revelation book is absolutely absurd, the idea that... Okay. By the way, I'll be doing a show literally on the book of Revelations in about a week and a half or two weeks oh. with Pastor Clarence Johnson. No, no pulling now, that's for sure. Huh? That's week for sure. and a half, two weeks. Yes. No problem, I listen every day anyway. But, I thought Revelations was bad, but I want you to know, Mr. Lasseter, if you get, you get it there, I've got the book here, but it's in another room, and I'm not going to get it out. But the name of the book is The Lost Scriptures. And here are some documents purportedly found in the era of around 400 years after Christ's uh, birth, in that time, there's roughly 400 years afterwards. And you, there's one by Barnabas, and there's one in which the Virgin Mary is, oh, she, so-and-so. And, -so. and if, if, if I thought that the Revelation was a bunch of absolute absurdity in terms of believing that as a basis for, for coping with the concept of a deity, I, I can see, I'll give the Catholic credit at that time and it was that phrase enough to get rid of the real rough stuff because it's utterly absurd. Next time I call, and I won't bug you again, because as I say, I, I know you're busy, but I, I've just waited so long to just ask you that question about the New Testament because I, I can say roughly then that, uh, as you recall, and you've got a better position to say that from than I. My, this, you can't really pin it down with uh, Gibbon or H.U. E. Wells, but... Around 400, they formed the New Testament, what became known later as the New Testament, all right? That's, that's a reasonably accurate statement, yeah. Okay, listen, thanks very much. I enjoy your program. You're fantastic. Have a good night. Thank you. Oh, lordy, lordy. Just about a minute away from the hour of 10 o'clock. Halfway mark for a Saturday night, May 31st, 1986. A philosophical and mellow last of this evening. Two more hours of mellowness. On a Saturday night at the radio station coming your way. CBS News at the top of the hour. Don't go far. <laughs> News Talk 
57 WPLP wishes to remind its listeners that the opinions expressed in this program do not necessarily reflect the views of management, staff, or sponsors. Never did understand those call disclaimer. Whose opinions would you think they were? Well, apparently, yeah, no. what a dumb question. That is really a dumb... Oh, by the way, welcome back. Six and a half minutes after the hour, ten o'clock, third hour of four on a Saturday night, May 31st, 1986, with me, Bob Lasseter. Um, a couple of calls back prior to the news this year. Woman called up and said something about... Uh, yeah, I'll to tell the plan if you're acting be more nice. I, I really don't know what kind of concept at least some people in the audience have of doing a talk show as though somebody tells you how to do it. There is no way in hell that anybody can tell you how to do three or four or five, because I used to do five-hour shows in Miami. How anybody can tell you to do it. When you walk into a room at the beginning of a program and you are faced with the potential of three, four, or five hours of dead air, and you are totally, completely on your own. It's a very interesting way to spend an evening, or an afternoon, or a morning, as the case may be, depending upon your shift. I personally find it, most of the time, very, very easy. Sometimes I find it impossible, and I'm always terrified. I mean, I... You do not, if, if you have an ounce of brains in your head, you do not come near me for the last hour, half hour, for sure, before my program. I mean, I'm just a nervous wreck. I frequently pace. And when the program is over, when I say the final bye-bye, see you tomorrow at four or whatever it turns out to be, uh, there is such a feeling of relief that comes over me. But I threatened to tell you how I got into business. I don't think I've ever told that story. It happened a little over a year and a half ago. It came in the middle of my divorce. I had lost my job when my marriage broke up because I just went to pieces. And I couldn't, couldn't even leave the house. And I'd lost my job and I was unemployed. And I was in the classic re-entry phase. I was going out seven nights a week. Having a grand old time. Bought all new clothes, changed my hairstyle. Was just having a grand old time. Coming home four, five, six, seven, eight o'clock in the morning. And I had gotten in very, very late. I was soundly asleep when 9.30 in the morning my phone rang. No one in his right mind would call me at 9.30 in the morning, even though I'm usually up. But still, nobody in his right mind would call me at 9.30 in the morning. So I answered the phone. There was a strange young woman named Marianne Deward. She was the executive producer and assistant to a man named Lee Fowler, who was the program director of WGBS in Miami, a talk station. The fourth talk station in Miami at the time. That is, bottom of the heap. Nobody listened to it. It was an awful station. Lee Fowler needed a weekend talk show host, and Lee Fowler couldn't have cared less what he put on on the weekends, and he still can. And he had gotten my name from a mutual friend. I had never spoken with him. I had never indicated in any shape, manner, or form that I wanted to do a talk show. But he had asked around the station, Hey, anybody here know anybody wants to do a talk show? And this mutual friend said, Yeah, this guy named Lassett, and he gave me forgave him uh, my phone number. And so Fowler had his secretary call me. And mind you, I'm still groggy from a night's worth of reveling. And I answer the phone, and this woman identifies herself, and she says, I'm calling for Lee Fowler. Would you like to do a talk show on WGBS? And I kind of looked at the phone. I did a double take, and I said, Yeah, sure, why not? She said, Could you start Saturday? And I think it was a Tuesday morning of me.